So um, we, we're getting together to have uh, a lot of people um, from a bunch of different countries tell us about their experience with the farmers' protests today and to share their analysis and talk a little bit about what we can learn from what happened to maybe understand some similarities between what's happening in different places and um, think a little bit about where that takes us in terms of thinking about strategies. Um, it's not where there's absolutely no pretense with this event today to create some sort of a grand overview. Um, we would have loved to have people from a lot more countries, especially also to have more people um, from countries at the margins and in the east of Europe. And we didn't manage to get that together. Um, so um, we're we're with um, we've got people here from France, from Germany, from the UK, Ireland, from Italy and from Spain. Uh, it's going to be a very packed session because we've got lots of presentations. Um, our heads will be smoking, but I think we'll also be very inspired. I'm really looking forward to hearing everybody. Um, our facilitation will be a bit tight. Um, the speakers already have been warned that we will give them signs when seven minutes are up. Uh, and basically the structure of this event is going to be quite classical in the sense that we have uh, five presentations and um, some of them done by two people. For, for kind of representing more or less five countries. And then we will have a Q&A and a conversation all together. Um, so that's more or less the idea for today. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about where we're coming from um, with this. So uh, those of us facilitating this event tonight, we're part of the Earthcare strand of Common Ecologies. And um, last year we ran a course called Tools and Tactics for Agroecological Transition which was a course with a lot of different collectives that are doing different things around changing agriculture. Um, many of the people speaking today were part of this course in one way or another. And I also know that many of you in the, in the, uh, here as participants tonight in the audience have also been in this course. You can see um, on our website, you can look into the detailed description of the course. And if you're interested in it on our YouTube playlist, um, we're called just Common Ecologies on YouTube. There's a playlist of all the presentations from that from that course. And um, from all the things we learned in that course, we felt like it was would be useful to kind of distill the lessons, um, the kind of tactical and strategic lessons we learned. And so we made um, a book, actually, a kind of toolkit like book for self print. It then um, it's 50 pages like this that uh, features 14 different strategies and uh, tactics. Um, for agroecological transition. Um, the book is called Transforming Agriculture and Beyond. And um, these tactics are to do with reclaiming land, with reclaiming labor and livelihoods, um, with um, using knowledge as a weapon, and also with um, fighting against agri-capitalist infrastructure. And um, many of the people who are here today have actually are featured in this book. So um, we're really organizing this event off the back of a lot of collective work and thinking and learning from people. So we're really happy that we managed to make that happen. And we did not only make a book, um, here you can see in the screen share um, some, of the, some of the tactics uh, in the index. It's This PDF is downloadable um, for free and quite easily online. And I believe the link has been or will be shared in the chat. Um, and to go with the book, just to tell you briefly, we made a poster, a very, very beautiful poster um, that is um, that kind of uh, celebrates and um, shows the interconnections between many of these rural and um, peri-urban or urban struggles. Um, and there's a lot more to say about the book and the poster is really wonderful materials. We think of them also as a toolkit for education and for organizing. And you can write us if you would like to have some proper sense and we really and download them. And on that poster too, you can see a lot of those um, struggles that, um, that we'll be speaking from to a certain extent today. Um, finally, just another kind of resource to mention to you because we have built up so many resources around this. We've made a lot of podcasts with, um, with the people that also will be speaking today where they talk in great depth about their different local struggles. And um, we'll also be sharing them. <laughs> Um, and those are all part of the Earthcare Fieldcast, which you can find on SoundCloud. So if you want to go deeper, you really have a lot of uh, you have a lot of possibilities there. Um, so that's sort of for the background. We're very happy that we managed to bring everybody together today, and um, 
one small technical thing still um, before I start framing the debate and pass over to the speakers um, is that we are having that we made a pad, a kind of repository pad for sharing links, announcements, um, uh, you know, texts, anything that people think is useful to to kind of um, share into this collective space. This pad will exist after the event. Also, you can also put comments and questions in there if anything comes to mind later. So that's also been shared in the chat. Um, and so finally, the questions that we come to this event with, um, I would just like to read them out briefly also for our speakers to kind of, um, uh, you know, to get ready in their mind for presenting. Um, we have very many questions. The ones that we kind of um, wrote down in this case are, how are the many organized farmers outside the agro-industrial mainstream relating to this, um, these many farmers protests that have been going on? What do our comrades from food sovereignty, agri-cooperative and anti-racist farming movements say and do right now? What may we learn from and with them? Um, and I should say that we're really excited because today um, we have people speaking from very different practices and struggles um, from peasant struggles to anti-racist <laughs> farming to um, political ecology, um, to the commons, to um, agroecology as a perspective. So I think it's going to be really rich also in the sense that, um, that there's like different analyses in different places they're speaking from. Um, obviously, a key question for us is how can we build a common analysis and demands across movements and places? And um, how also can we as movements for socio-ecological justice that maybe aren't in any in all cases to do with farming per se support those struggles so how can we create some sort of synergy across movements at this point um and what does it mean to think this across borders um obviously within the eu and within europe but also globally it's another key point for us here and we um we know that um, we invited you all because we know that the point here is not to you know scandalize how reactionary these protests are simply or to kind of uh, idealize them but that we try and get some kind of complex analysis going so um with that um i think we can pass over to the presentations and um i will maybe hand over to laura to briefly introduce our first speakers from spain yes thank you manu and thank you everyone for joining us I'm really glad to present uh, Elena and Diego. Uh, if anyone can tell me if the sound is going well, that would be very nice. Okay. Very good. Thank you. So I'm really glad to present Elena and Diego. Both of them come from Nos Plantamos, which uh, I mean, of course, correct me uh, if I mistake something. It's a growing network platform going confluence of organizations for agroecology and food sovereignty in Spain that has been growing from since September when they did a camp and uh, a campaign and a camp for politicizing um, like food sovereignty and bringing back uh, agroecology into the agenda. And they are members of also of Ecologistas en Acción. Um, which is this confederation with more than 300 uh, environmental social ecologist groups distributed through towns and cities across the territory of Spain. Um, Elena is part of the coordination of the agroecology section in Ecologistas en Acción. She has a degree in environmental and political science, if I'm not mistaken. And she's also coordinating a campaign on the consequences of the agro-industry in the south of Spain. Diego is um, a molecular, molecular biologist and he owns an organic farm in Asturias in the north of Spain. So we are talking of different uh, places in across the, the territory in Spain. He's also a member of Ecologistas en Acción, Nos Plantamos, and the association that defends rural workers in Asturias. So I pass the word to both of them and yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, Laura, for inviting us to this event. Um, we really tried to be fast, so I jump into it directly. 
Um, to give you a bit of a context of the demonstrations in Spain, so basically the main farmers' organizations or associations, which are called Asaja, Coac, and UPA in Spain, began different mobilizations on the 6th of February uh, in various parts of the country um, to, yeah, to join the wave of protests and mobilization that are taking pl um, place in several countries in Europe. That's why we are here today. And um, apart from these bigger farmers' organizations, there are also smaller ones that are joining the protests, um, labor unions from the Basque Country, from Galicia, but also um, yeah, other groups, uh, smaller groups um, like Ramaderas de Catalunya, which are um, like um, shepherds. Um, yeah, shepherds. Um, and um, as you see, as you can see, like there's a, a huge diversity of people who are currently on the street, and um, so are uh, the demands they are bringing to the street. Um, so I tried to resume them a bit uh, without being exhaustive. Um, so one of the um, one of the main demands is uh, the protest against the environmental regulatory requirements. Although um, there are also segments um, of these uh, of these protests that are really clear in their demands that they think that the transition towards a different food system is really necessary. So we have a bit of both, even though the I would say the first one um, against the environmental requirements is a bit louder. Um, then there are also demands on putting on hold the free trade agreement negotiations under the way in the European Union, such as the Mercosur agreement. There are uh, really loud voices on like fairer prices um, and also against um, the bureaucratization, um, yeah, which they are suffering, like all the paperwork. Um, and um, Maybe to come to the critiques we have, uh, first of all, um, on these protests, because uh, as you were saying in the beginning, like um, we are like somehow struggling to analyze these uh, protests and also and in some way we're also part of them. So um, yeah, some critiques we, we were analyzing um, before this event um, in these weeks is that um, what I already said, the protests against environmental measures, um, especially against the Agenda 2030 and also the eco schemes in, of the CAP. And for us, uh, the problem is not that the policy proposes to reduce imports or inputs or other environmental measures, but um, which we see uh, like we consider them necessary. Um, but the problem is that it, it wants um, the costs of doing so to be assumed solely by um, by the sector, no, and which is already stifling. And um, and we really think that policies should, um, yeah, support this uh, really necessary transition. And um, but we are very clear um, in our stand that uh, maintaining a strong agricultural sector also means adapting to climate change and collaborating with the uh, conserv conservation of um, biodiversity. Um, then another thing we see is um, like inequalities or maybe rather a lack of representation in these um, protests. So these days we keep seeing tractors um, that um, yeah, we, no, we keep seeing like people uh, on the streets, which are um, mostly men and mostly um, white men. And um, this is not really representing what is uh, happening or who is like um, working in the Spanish countryside. So, um, of course, there's like a huge amount of women working in the countryside, which um, used to be invisibilized. And there's also a lot of, um, yeah, like laborers, daily, um, daily laborers, uh, and uh, a huge part of them are migrants. And we also don't see migrants on the street. So this is also definitely one critique we have. And then um, just to come really, I mean, this is a really big topic, and um, but uh, I found it important to mention that there were these attempts of cooptation by the far right. Um, although I want to emphasize that the manifestations itself are not um, 
like guided by the right and um, many farmers unions clearly took a stance um, against this cooptation. But what we saw is that the right wing parties pre present itself as supporters um, of the farmers protests, although they are they have demonstra um, demonstrably voted against laws um, in the last years that um, are intended to improve the situation of farmers. And one example in Spain is the law on food supply, um, which was passed in 2020 and which is intending, among other things, to um, to um, ensure that agricultural products are not sold below um, the cost of production. And they voted against um, the state, against this law or abstained. And then um, also the case of the free trade agreements, they, um, in all the votes also on the European level, they were always in favor of that. Um, I don't know how I'm in time, but, um, I just want to mention that Two there's another left. complex. Okay, um, maybe then I can come to this later to give um, Diego a bit of time to. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, yeah. As, as uh, Laura mentioned, I'm a. Now I'm currently a small farmer in the north of Spain. Small, I mean like micro farm. So it sounds like under half a hectare, uh, specializing in market gardening and um, so diverse vegetable grower. Um, so as such, I am a bit of an outlier in the current uh, Spanish uh, system and uh, European wide system, I would say. Uh, I don't know how it's in the rest of countries, but in Spain, um, for example, with the CAP, 80% um, of the money that Spain receives for the CAP goes to uh, big agribusiness. Uh, so we're talking about like, you know, uh, thousands of hectares and commodity crops, right? It's generally farmers who don't grow food themselves, they still have to go to the supermarket to get their food. So they're also suffering from the inflation costs uh so begs the question right um and and there's an ever more uh uh the the, the big agri there's a big investments funds now uh, buying a lot of land in spain at the moment so you really it's a, a bit contradictory right because if agriculture is so unprofitable and we have to um protest why is a big business going into it right so you really have to that 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 gives us a bit of a clue no? of, of of where how this system is working. Um, yeah. Uh, so for us as a organization, Ecologistas en Acción, uh, we have been advocating for a very long time that uh, the energy resources in the in the world are not uh, finite, and that we have a big problem with. Um, with climate change and we see it as no coincidence that it is exactly now at this time that all these protests are emerging around Europe. It is uh, for us, it is uh, definitely some, uh, the cause is definitely the, the increase in prices for, for farmers, of course, but also the the immense uh, losses that farmers are suffering right now with, with the climate change. And it, 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 it's pretty crazy here in Spain and probably all around Europe. And yeah, what I that was that's a bit like to to get a bit of an analysis and to come into the the question of what uh, what how, what are we doing and how are we organizing it? Uh, so yeah, uh, Laura mentioned we are trying to start like a small union here in Asturias that represents small farmers. Asturias, because of our geography, it's a very mountainous place, so we cannot just geographically have big extension of farms. So we have that advantage. So most of the farms here are small scale. So we can, we're trying, there, we don't have a, a union representing us at the moment. Most uh, unions here represent uh, cattle farmers. So there's a big milk uh, industry here. And there it's a, well, milk is a commodity. So it's obviously the, the interests are very different than what we, uh, we grow. And then a bit unrelated, I would also like to mention that we are currently uh, uh, starting a European-wide uh, um, uh, alliance, which is the European Alliance for Regenerative Agriculture, uh, it's EARA, 
and th this is a movement of uh, regenerative farmers all around Europe, and we're trying to uh, get together and and try to to well to see if from the farmers we can uh, create a, a movement that influences policy and 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 towards uh, benefiting like farmers that have good practices in the, in their in their farms and. Thank you, and, Diego. Yeah, Can you please wrap, wrap it up? <laughs> I think I'm 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 done with that. I, I'm under very intense time pressure. So yeah. Sorry. Yeah, about maybe that. we can. Yeah, maybe just uh, later we can talk a bit more if you have questions on Nos Plantamis. Um, David is also here. I saw him in the audience. So um, we are happy to answer questions. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, totally. We'll have. We try to have a lot of time to also talk together later and um, for this campaign that you mentioned Diego and all this um, if you want to drop it into this common pad um, we collect stuff like that there so now I would pass over um, to Nadine we're going to travel to Germany and Nadine will introduce our next yes so I will present Anne Kling Maya very quickly who is here uh, with us today um, so she's from the ABL Germany, which is the German Association of Farmers Struggles, if one can translate it like this. And um, Anne has also been in our Earth Care field cast um, on, yeah, and talked a lot about access to land, land rights, socialization. Also, right on my table, I have this book where there's a very nice article of Anne and Gesine Langlott. Um, and and this week, I already met Anna in another event um, around the Let Socialize um, conference that is happening in Germany in two weeks. So, yeah, I'm happy that you're here with us again in another context today. So, welcome. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, then I would just start. Um, so, what happened in Germany? Um, so in Germany, the government removed the agricultural fuel subsidies in December. Um, so they talked about it and then it already started before Christmas that there have been like some protests, but it was not escalating and it, was, it wasn't so clear what uh, was going to happen. So we already assumed um, that it would escalate in January because there were like announcements for big, big demonstrations and protests. But um, it wasn't sure if the government would like change the strategy or something. So we always talked about the drop that caused the barrel to overflow. So this is like a German phrase <laughs> that I just translated, which means that there already have been a lot, a lot of problems. And the um, agricultural fuel subsidies, it was just like the last drop um, to get the, yeah, the... The atmosphere is so there was this mobilization from the Deutsche Bauernverband um, since December, um, and it was escalating in the beginning of January. So thousands of tractors have been blocking Berlin, other cities, highway nodes, and also in the rural area. So it was kind of a very decentral um, protest. Um, so almost every city was um, affected or blocked. Um, we also had, like uh, you already talked about how it is in Spain, um, this infiltration or co cooptation from the right. And um, in the beginning, the Deutsche Bauernverband, which is the biggest um, farmers association in Germany, which is kind of conservative and uh, blocking a lot of environmental measurements and so on, like it's kind of a lobby thing for the, um, for the agro industry, but also representing a lot of farms and farmers. Um, they demarcated from the rights, but like kind of late, but in the end they did. So as in Spain, um, we have a similar story with the AfD here, which is the right-wing party. Um, they are like in their programs, they are generally against any forms of subsidies for farms. Um, but uh, in general, they presented themselves like a supportive um, party for the farmers. Um, which is quite interesting because I think it's like quite a parallel to the Spain context. Then to I would like to show somehow the main actors. So we have the Deutsche Bauernverband, which is definitely the largest farmers association. Um, then we have LSV, which is kind of a mixture of, uh, um, yeah, 
a lot of farms and it also has a quite of a problem with right people so there are a lot of right people in it and at the beginning it was quite a um yeah progressive um alliance but now um it yeah or not now it like almost a years like some years ago it already didn't um get the problem um with a position against the rights and then now we have the Freie Bauern, which is quite bright. Um, and they have shown up quite intense right now in January um, and mobilized a lot. And then we have the ABL, which is the Peasant Farmer Struggle Association, <laughs> like Nadine um, called it. Um, and this is kind of the progressive farming association in Germany. And we also have the Young ABL, the Junge ABL, which is the youth organization. And then there have been like other actors, like for example, the FAU, which is a workers union and so on, but it's like rather small. But yeah, these are I think the main actors. Um, so I don't know how I am in the time. I had like some examples showing um, what I mean with this right infiltration and cooptation. Um, but it was not only that, there have also been like progressive demonstrations organized by the RBL and um, and other people. So it was a mixture of everything. And I think um, it's similar to Spain again, um, that, the RB, that the RBL positioned itself like part of the struggles in a way, because we have a similar analysis of the situation and of the problems. And it's like we kind of understand, um, or we do understand um, the, the motivation behind the protests. But at the same time, it's quite difficult to balance um, being part of the struggle and at the same time not being part of the right struggles. Um, yeah, so I think this is another similarity. Um, then what have the young ABL and the ABL um, done and achieved? Um, they had a lot of media attention. So a lot of new contacts have been created and also new alliances. Um, so the Junge ABL, the youth organization, was I think it was the first one with statements and positioning against the far rights. Um, this is kind of interesting because of that there was a lot of attention um, after that. And yeah, there also was a lot of support from other structures, from other movements, for example, from the climate justice movement and others. Um, yeah, and the ABL organized own demonstrations, spoke up also on demonstration of the Deutsche Bauernverband to show that there are um, yeah, that um, in this kind of analysis of the problems, they kind of stand together and also to like change the debates and the discourses a bit. So there was also um, the ABL um, yeah, suggested some measurements, which is called the six point plan from the ABL, which is quite interesting. Um, and it was also supposed to change a bit the directions of the debate. So these measurements, they wouldn't cost anything and you could implement them directly. So it was quite nice to have them while talking to the media and so on. Um, yeah, right now, I would guess it's quite calm um, around the protests in Germany. But before, there was also the annually demonstration in Berlin, which is called the Wir haben es satt demonstration. Um, and it's like an progressive demonstration for an agricultural transition. It happens in Berlin since I think over 10 years, since 2011 or something. Um, and it is always in the week in January where there is the Green Week. So the Green Week is one of the most important international um, trade fairs for the food industry, agriculture and horticulture. Um, and it's a, an alliance between um, NGOs and um, like farming organizations like the AVL mainly the area which is also quite um like attention to get all of them together in like one structure one demonstration and a lot of um yeah it's a lot of debates and discussions um of the positions like what is it that uh that we have in common and what uh, is it that we don't have in common the ngos and the farming associations and so on um yeah and now like i mentioned it's kind of um calm around the protests um and i think there are some things going on like the agrarstrukturgesetze which is uh, a law that uh, is discussed in different parts of germany right now in the parliaments um which is talking about the structure um of 
agriculture in the country, like, okay, it's mostly in the um, in the countryside, but it talks a lot about um, access to land and so on. Um, yeah, I think Okay, that, please wrap it up. Yeah, I think that's it. Um, I just wanted to say that there are other, I've seen other people of Germany here in the... Um, in the call and it would be great if they could also answer questions and if they don't agree with my <laughs> summary or something that they just speak up um yeah and i'm looking forward to the other speakers and the discussion tonight so that's it <laughs> thank you so much anna um very cool to also start hearing about some of the alliances and some of the strategic thinking around alliances i'm really curious to hear about other countries in that respect too um we keep posting links to um, the podcast with Anna in our book, um, this um, campaign that the ABL did about around a lease of public land um, is featured very prominently as one of the tactics and there's a lot to learn from them. So I'm very thankful to have had you here. I'm looking forward to hearing from others later. Um, now we would move on to France. And um, from France, we have um, Habib and Justine from Association A Quatre. Um, which is uh, an association, uh, Acadre, I will try and say it in French and English, and then you can correct me with all the things I might get wrong. But um, it basically stands for um, Association d'accueil en agriculture et artisanat, so something like an association for the hosting of agriculture and crafts activities. And it's a group of that um, has a significant number of um, people that have worked in agriculture for a long time and that come also from the African continent and have different kinds of knowledges of agriculture. And um, they uh, they produce food and uh, they there's an amazing film about them. They do all kinds of uh, interesting activities that um, we will hear about. We're really happy to have you here. Um, Akatre is also in our book um, with a tactic to do with um, anti-racist farming. I don't remember the exact title of the tactic now, but um, we also made a podcast with them. So you can dive into their work. It's super exciting. And we're so happy to have you here also to have this perspective on, I mean, um, like we already heard from Elena before that, um, you know, who is being represented in these protests also in the mainstream media is one of the things that we've been wondering about. And, um, you know, the fact that actually most food uh, is, or that, that uh, seasonal migrant workers are um, the main people actually producing and harvesting food in Europe is uh, not at all mentioned in anywhere, <laughs> any analysis of this. So so it's really cool, I think, that we can have this this viewpoint here too. And of course, France, which um, is always on fire and uh, exciting to hear about. Um, so thanks so much for being with us and over to you, Justine um, and Habib which we have to still we still have to spotlight hello everybody so i'm habib uh justine i can start and after that you you, you can finish uh, after me or you want to start if you hear me no no please start i will okay so thank you, Manu, for, for welcoming us in um, in this uh, conversation. Uh, yeah, there is many manifestation. Uh, they come out here in France. We do care um, of this, but I think me, I want to mention um, the site. Uh, the site they, they didn't talk uh, in the manifestation, like to speak the um, for the people like working. Um, in the farmers, like um, hand uh, hand workers, like people coming from Africa, and from Spain, from everywhere. So during the manifestation, I think there is nobody like uh, speaking for them, right? And even just mentioning them. So we, uh, with our collective, I think we were holding this um, around uh, here in France. But we we couldn't have a, a way to to speak uh, for this, and um, uh, yeah, Justine, you can go ahead. Yes, um, as um, as Habib said, I think we will focus on the anti-racist per perspective, even if. Um, there are a lot of similarities, I think, between France and what was mentioned about um, Germany and Spain, especially this um, 
the rise of the far right uh, as a support for the farmers. But I think something that um, we want to threaten is that um, it's really a farm holder movement, of course. Um, that's the main point. It's wide, but it's because the, it's the farm holders that are protesting and that that, that are uh, represented in the main unions. Um, and when you look at the numbers uh, for the last 20 years, you see that this population of farm um, holders and uh, of uh, family members working on farms is really decreasing a lot. That's also a big issue. There are a lot of um, farmers uh, going, uh, that are going to uh, retire and that are already retiring. Um, while the population of agricultural workers is increasing a lot and it's becoming more important. There are more people that are working um, in the lands uh, and in the, um, in the fields that do not own uh, the lands than the country. And of course, this is not at all reflected in those kind of protests. Uh, and it's not taken into account by the uh, government uh, governmental uh, responses on um, yeah it's completely overlooked so it was already mentioned but it's a big issue and this is something we are trying to work on it uh, the question of how to um, yeah um, fight against this uh, union imbalance and to to advocate for uh, agricultural workers, uh, stronger unions also, and to um, to support uh, agricultural workers' rights. And just as an example, so in in France, the movement um, started in November, and it became uh, stronger in January. And on February first, the prime minister, French prime minister, um, announced some uh, big. Um, measures um, that do not really uh, reflect also like the farmers' revendications, um, but that do reflect more the really the, the head of the majority union revendications uh, that is very close to the government and that focus on uh, the reduction um, of constraints on norms and that means that uh, it is allowed to use more chemicals again for instance and in French we had um, some regulation that were even stronger than the uh, other countries of in Europe in terms of um, uh, chemicals that were banished and this is cancelled this French specificity has been cancelled and this is also a bit um issue for agricultural workers because they are the more concerned by the this exposure to chemicals when they are uh, working uh, so they are the first affected on uh, one of the communication by the farmers was also um or rather the the response uh, by the government was the promise of simplification, less norms, and this also concerns um, the um, attribution um, and um, the conditions for employment of uh, workers, and uh, especially uh, foreign um, migrant workers, uh, which mean also less right for uh, agricultural workers. So one of the government response uh like two of the government responses are directly affecting uh agricultural workers and this was also um overlooked and yeah i think um something else that we can mention but yeah that the two main points on something that we are trying to investigate also on something that we want to to work more on um, with our association. We are also trying to create some uh, link with um, the Peasant Confederation, which is um, the um, more leftist uh, farmers union and peasant union to work together on this issue. And we are also trying to work with uh, 
other workers unions to make connections and to yeah make those uh, questions more vocal but it's really a big work on as you already mentioned before a european question uh, that um european uh, agriculture rely on the workforce of people coming uh, from outside and whose rights are uh, mostly denied at a European scale. Um, yeah, and more broadly, um, it's uh, what is overlooked also on something we try to work on with the association is um, to make so some connection with farmers from the south and um, there are also this imbalance that uh, French on European agriculture rely a lot in term of in terms of fuel, in terms of um, energy, in terms of chemicals. It rely on an a extractivist agriculture on colonial. Uh, it's a colonial agriculture, so um, that's also a big issue and something that is very much overlooked. So. Yeah, thank you a lot for organiz the organization of this event. And I don't know if, Abby, if you want to add something. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much, you two. We it's are happy to answer question later. Thank you. Cool. We could go into, I hope we'll go into some depth. It's super relevant. I think this quite, I'm super curious to hear also from other countries whether there is any visibility of migrant labor whatsoever in any of the other protests or not at all. And um, I think also, I'm really curious also to hear like the mainstream media representation of all this and whether that is like broadly the same in all those different countries. We'll, we'll talk about all that later. I'll pass over to Laura again, because now we're going to Italy. And Laura will introduce our speaker. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm really glad also to be introducing um, Andrea Gelti. He's uh, a friend, uh, uh, an advisor and a friend of Common Ecologies Group. Hello. Thank you for sharing with us the um, Cambiar el Campo um, website. Uh, it's this conference that they are organizing. He's part of Genuino Clandestino. He's part of Mondeji Bene Comune. Uh, reality in the outskirts of Florence that for over a, more than a decade they have been uh, working for defend the public land as a common good and he's also part of Cagenino Clandestino which is a, a network in Italy that vindicates the right of peasant uh, agriculture, peasant uh, agroecology and they develop campaigns and peasant markets all over the country. There is a podcast that we also did with him that you can listen to in our Earth Kurt Pilcast, and we can drop it there. And I just give the floor to him, and we want to hear more about Italy. Thank you, Andrea. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Manu. Thank you very much, Laura. And thank you very much to you all today. It's really interesting to follow the different perspective and national situations. And could you hear me? Sorry, because I... it's okay. Okay, great, great, great. So I'm from Mondeggi, so an experienced, um, um, an occupied farm, um, not very far away from, from Florence, 10 kilometers from Florence, where the theme of agroecology, it has always been developed within the theme of the commons, okay? So the access to the land, the making uh, possibility of connection between the rural and, and the urban context through participatory guarantee systems and self-organized markets. So the, the question of agroecology as, uh, as a practice first. And uh, I'm saying this because it's a bit connected to what I will say <laughs> after, because for us, uh, of course, the, the dynamic of the protest is a big turbulence is a big balance uh, and it's um, another some of the radical crisis uh, of the supply chain and agriculture in Europe in, uh, in general and it's mainly a crisis from within the system even if of course the un economical unsustainability of the situation are affecting mainly also small farmers not only big uh, farmers uh, that are at the moment leading the protest in uh, in Italy 
Um, related to, to Italy, uh, okay, the main demands and claims are very similar with uh, the mentioned, as mentioned before in other countries. Maybe there is one peculiarity. In Italy, we have all the protest and the demo against, uh, against the uh, big, uh, most representative uh, farmers' organization. Okay, so all the demonstrations are against, also against the EU, but strongly, we will say less against the government of Italy and more against the main organization. So to speak, the actual main organization in Italy is called, called Diretti. They are managing directly the Ministry of Agriculture of the very far right Italian government at the moment. So they have their own ministry there. Uh, so they are strongly uh, in uh, the politics of the far, uh, the far right, and this is the biggest one. Uh, and for example, they are called directly, they are participating in most, but they are completely outside the protest in, in Italy. And the other, um, uh, the other thing is that in Italy, we don't have a peasant organization, okay? We don't have a peasant com confederation. Uh, and there are... Uh, um, many small assemblies, uh, processes of organization, collective, uh, local processes of uh, food sovereignty initiatives, but we don't have uh, uh, a power to make stronger our voice and make uh, evident ecological alternative. All the debate is in, in, in the in the main debate within the far right. So basically there is part of the far right who own it, the, the, the Ministry of Agriculture of Italy, another party of far right called Liga, Liga Nord, Salvini, who is staying more supporting the demo. So for us it's very problematic that all the debate is framed within two different options of far right. It, even if, of course, there is uh, the risk of an ecological backlash within this movement, uh, there is a strong connection with uh, the flag of uh, uh, regressive nationalism, but there are also uh, significant uh, claims uh, that emerge within this mobilization that we cannot uh, ignore. Eh? The question uh, of uh, um, the question, for example, that in Italy in the last 10 years, uh, one third of um, um, agricultural company were shut down. Basically, the fact that it's becoming uh, year after year more difficult uh, having an economical survival, especially for small farmers. And in fact, uh, the part of Italy, which, from my opinion, is interesting, is Sicily. Also, because the composition of the movement is more related to this small owner and not the big owner, for example, of Pianura Padana. And also because Sicily, and I was mentioning also before, for Sicily, 2023 was a nightmare in terms of dry, in terms of dryness. Mm. And there, the situation is a bit more uh, interesting. In general, we think, in, as, a, as analysis and also as a strategy, that um, of course, there are problems and issues in this mobilization, and but uh, from the other side is another symptoms of the crisis uh, of the mainstream uh, agriculture and its uh, unsustainability. Um, we are trying to making our voice stronger, uh, and the link uh, before is the link of uh, one agroecological conference uh, that we are organizing in Rome between. Uh, uh, the first and the third of March, so soon, and this is an attempt uh, of connecting more, more uh, AT organization, collective, uh, local agroecological initiative, and uh, uh, peasant struggles, uh, because uh, we think that agroecology as a practice uh, has many, many local and territorial uh, initiatives, uh, and they are developing in the last 10 years quite significantly in Italy, but uh, the power of our every practice or the power of the social imaginary coming from the desire of another relation with the land uh, are not anymore enough, and we need much more communication power, which is the power of intervening public debate 
and re-articulating the order of discourse of the public debate. And we need also level of organization, of collective uh, organization, uh, of course, putting at the center the federative uh, input coming from the centrality of the territorial struggles and initiative. Uh, but we are trying to make a, a confluence, uh, an agricultural confluence, uh, knowing that uh, we don't have a peasant voice. And the attempt is try to make, and we, we don't know eh, if it will work. We need a bit to believe in the process. But the process is trying to develop uh, a level of organization that will be able, eh, there will be a journal, and a journal connected with uh, the event, uh, and the number zero will be distributed uh, at Cambiare il Campo, is transforming the field, modifying, yeah, trans changing the field will be in, in English. Uh, the ecology, the general meaning of this event is within the strategy of uh, convergence. Uh, in Italy, we had an, uh, an important experience of a, an occupied uh, factory nearby Florence. It's called uh, GKN Factory, and they quoted the factory and developed uh, a process of uh, eco-social transition from below led by workers, by the working class, but in strong alliance with ecological movements, the territorial mobilization, and also knowledge. Eh? So, and this culture of convergence uh, opening the space uh, in which uh, different sectors of, um, for example, uh, youth mobilization around the climate question or territorial struggle, for instance, uh, the destruction of mountains and extractivism as a every day mental and ecological movement connecting uh, uh, together and we organized a section of this big big demo months ago and our section was insurgent natures no as a, Andrea as a please wrap it up in... soon I, I have to close okay okay so yes in terms of strategy we think that uh, uh, it's uh, very relevant to understand uh, the good reasons within the mobilization that they are covered by the uh, mainstream uh, and the hegemonic role of a far right imaginary, which is very, very problematic. It's part of our time, unfortunately. And their side makes stronger our capacity of organization and communicative power, which will be first of all. Uh, confluence amongst different agroecological experience in a broader frame of what does mean ecological connection within uh, the uh, broader social ecological movement for uh, climate uh, and social justice. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Um, great to hear about Italy. Um, and we can keep talking later about the strategic horizons. Also very exciting to always hear about these alliances happening in Italy. Um, so um, now we would move on to the last presentation. Um, it's already dense here, which is um, coming from Ireland and the UK, from the Root and Branch Collective, um, where we have um, Alex and Pat uh, speaking to us. The Root and Branch Collective has been getting together since about a year. It's a re collective of researchers, farmers, activists that um, work on kind of agrarian justice. Um, and um, Alex is a farmer, um, Pat is more of a researcher, you can talk more about yourselves, obviously. Um, I think it's, um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to getting your perspectives also, because I think there's also a lot of political ecology related questions in there that um, you might kind of shed light on. But um, overall, even if the UK is um, no longer part of the EU, and so there's like possibly some different issues, I think, um, it's really cool to um, to hear what's happening over on that side of the islands. So over to you too, and thanks very much for being with us also. Thanks, I'm going first, I think. Is that right, Alex? Yeah, okay, thank you, um, Manuela, and for the Common Ecologies for organizing um, this. It's great to hear the other speakers and to, you know, just get together and talk about these things. Um, obviously, we have a very short amount of time and, we're covering a lot between Alex and I. So I thought that it would be useful maybe to give a little bit of a, a context to the farmer protests in Ireland and how they have um, sort of developed in a 
like a clearly reactionary but also political um direction and uh use that maybe as a, a a jumping off point or a basis to sort of pose some questions so i'm going to end with some questions that is a little bit annoying sometimes but you know here we are you know just uh you know throwing questions in the pot and then maybe we can circle back to them so um i also just want to say at the outset that there are um you know two main um farmer led food sovereignty organizations on the island of ireland talibio and the land workers alliance in northern ireland and i can put some links in the in the chat um and i don't represent either of those organizations though i am a member of talibio and i can see that there are people from both organizations here so hopefully they can speak up in the q and a too okay so um the the history of the, the protests here actually um, can be well it can be traced back very long but I think significantly to 2019 when there were um, farm protests so tractors blockaded the capital Dublin and they also picketed um, meat processing plants um, the protesters or the farmers were predominantly from beef and uh, sheep uh, farming sectors uh, rather than the, the dairy sector so there's quite a big divide there I mean leaving aside horticulture and tillage but the beef and sheep farmers are the ones that were most, um, uh, I guess, sort of mobilized at that point and have been you know, since then. And the main focus of their protest in 2019 was the price that they were getting from the processors. So it was a very specific sort of economic grievance that they were organizing around. Um, a group was formed out of those protests called the Beef Plan, and maybe similar to what Andrea was saying, it was a kind of a, a renegade or a split off from the main farmers organization, which is the IFA here, that largely represents the dairy farmers and the dairy processors. Um, and so the Beef Plan formed, there was also a Facebook group that was formed at around that time. So then you fast forward four years to uh, early 2023. And coming out of that Facebook group, which had grown quite a big following, a new organization was formed called the Farmers Alliance. So initially, the Farmers Alliance on its website just claimed to be a grassroots farmer led movement. It seemed quite benign. It was about connecting farmers with rural and urban uh, consumers. It definitely drew on some kind of food sovereignty discourse, some of the more populist aspects of food sovereignty discourse about like giving power back to farmers, anti-corporate, um, also about localizing food systems and food supply chains. So this Farmers Alliance at its launch in April of last year invited Caroline uh, van der Plas, who's the leader of the Dutch BBB party, to come to speak. And at the launch, she encouraged the, the Farmers Alliance to um, contest elections, the local elections that are coming up here and the European elections that are coming up here. So they took up that invitation and what they've done is they've sort of expanded their policy platforms on their website. Now they have sections on housing, on education, on migration, on health, and obviously also agriculture. They've also become uh, or have been very vocal around anti-migrant protests. So in Ireland, uh, you know, for quite a while now, there has been some really violent um, attacks on uh, buildings that have been designated to house asylum seekers and in some cases not actually designated and in rural towns uh, the farmers alliance have been very strong in supporting those um, those uh, anti-migrant protests um, okay so that's the farmers alliance they've basically made very clear that they're moving away from protest and they're moving towards political organization and that's where they're channeling channeling their energy and it's obviously we'll wait and see how they do hopefully they don't do very well um, but i think that the evolution of the farmers alliance from 2019 poses some questions for the food sovereignty movement and also for the left probably more generally um in 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 ireland and, and abroad so um what have they done they've basically turned into from a, a kind of a grassroots movement into a political organization that's what they're trying to do They've also moved beyond the issues of food and agriculture to capture quite explicitly other particularly rural grievances and discontents and to sort of absorb them into their platform. Um, they are, but they're, they're so they also draw on some of the food sovereignty discourse, as I said, but they are clearly reactionary insofar as they explicitly defend the family. Uh, they're anti-transgender, uh, um, they defend private property very clearly, 
they have a, a, a very exclusive idea of national sovereignty, which they also talk about. Um, so the questions that I want to kind of pose um, and that we can maybe circle back to are what would a progressive version of the Farmers Alliance look like? You know, is that a useful question to, to put there? Um, what would or how would it differentiate itself from the Farmers Alliance? Who would it form alliances with in Ireland and also internationally? What kind of policy platform would it develop and how would it develop it around housing, around migration, around the environment? Um, who would it appeal to and how would it try and grow its base? Basically, the questions that the Farmers Alliance are, are asking and you know working on quite effectively. And I think this definitely relates to what Andrea was saying about the, the convergence and the need to um, sort of expand communicative power, I think was the, the word that he was using, but also this idea of, um, you know, uh, e extending relations beyond the food and land justice movements and thinking about how that links with what are very quite, are quite active now in Ireland, at least around housing around cost of living, also pro-Palestinian movements, where there is a lot of energy about, you know, where that convergence is and what that looks like. I think that that's, you know, really where we need to be going. But I'll leave it there and I, I'll pass it on to Alex. Thanks, Paddy. Um, yeah, I'll try and fly through this. So, protests in the UK are based around a new campaign called No Farmers, No Food, which has grown in size very quickly. It's a catchy title, it's filling a gap, and um, British farmers haven't protested for decades. This an astroturfed organization founded by an opportunistic right-wing conspiracist and climate skeptic, but farmers are adopting it en masse. Most of the protests are against new government policies, which are aimed at green transitions, but also against poor prices for produce and new trade deals. Uh, farmers argue the need to protect national food security and food production. To understand this, I'll give some background context by explaining the new post-Brexit changes to policies and subsidies and regulations. Uh, which vary between nations, but are basically um, based on the concept of public payments or public goods. Um, farmers were told they'd be paid to make it work, but in line with austerity, uh, the money probably isn't quite there for it um, and is likely to be further cut. So I'll focus on England and Wales, as that's what I know more about. In England, a new scheme begins with essentially picking list, uh, pick a mix list of actions. You get paid per hectare. They've made it unequal between uplands and lowlands. They've even buried research on how to screw up upland farmers. There are upper tiers, but these are undersupported, and farmers who were previously on ag environment schemes have been rejected, which ends up threatening habitats they've created. In Wales, there is um, a more involved scheme, although it's still in consultation, but uh, um, it in currently includes 17 mandatory universal actions. And most controversially, it includes requirement to plant 10% of the farm to trees and manage 10% for semi-natural habitat. Environmentally, that's good, but only if it's workable. And crucially, all of this sits within a rising, within a context of rising cost of production and more debt. Uh, many farms can't afford to lose that productive land and the signs of that the um, payments won't be enough, although we don't have the details yet. Uh, research has suggested um, research by Welsh government is going to have a massive impact on the Welsh farming economy. Um, yeah, many, many farms are also prohibited as well by their bank or landlord, um, as if planting trees could lead to a devaluation of land, and most farms can't afford the consequences of that. In response, we're seeing growing dissatisfaction and protest, particularly in Wales, with tractor protests and thousands turning out to regional rallies. There's also been some protests in England, but smaller in comparison so far, which might be something interesting to compare. Um, there's a relatively large opposition to the scheme in Wales, um, but in England it's more fragmented. Um, I suggest this partly stems from the class composition of farming in each country, with Wales being mostly uplands and England being mostly lowlands. In Wales, there's also an important language and national question involved in this. So to close up, um, my feeling is that this is a reaction against neoliberal policies and there is a sense amongst farmers of not being heard or recognised. And I think the policies will see a further concentration of land ownership as farms are forced to sell up to competitors. Um, and yeah, I mean, as far as like food sovereignty's role in this, I'll just reflect really more on what Paddy has said. And there's just questions there really. And so far, food sovereignty organisations haven't really been involved. Um, 
And yeah, I, I wonder why that is and whether there's ways forward here and where we would go um, from a food sovereignty perspective. Okay, thank you.